Chapter two, ready to dive in? If you haven't heard the first chapter of this series about bio waste and agriculture, go check it out first so you can follow the story. It's called Healthy Soils and the Carbon Quest. You'll find it on our site, greenexchange.se, or in your favorite podcast app. Before we start to boom, shake, shake, shake the room, I'd like to mention a very promising event. The Circular Materials Conference 2016 in Gothenburg, Sweden, on May 10th, 11th and 12th. This event will review the latest industrial and scientific progress in circular use of materials. There is a very impressive list of guest speakers, an exhibition and exciting activities around the sessions. You'll find information on our episode page, or you can directly visit the website at circularmaterialsconference.se. We hope to see you there. We're now entering the wonderful world of EU recycling targets. That's the title of chapter two. Fire, let's go. Let's go to Belgium, Brussels. In our episode about circular economy last year, we were expecting the EU circular economy package and discussing the level of ambition we should expect. This policy package finally came out in December, and don't worry, we're going to talk circular economy extensively this year. In the meantime, um, we have Ferran Rosa on the line. Uh, Ferran is policy officer at Zero Waste Europe and he's going to help us understand the recycling part of the circular economy policy package. Hello. Hi Ferran. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh, thanks for being with us. Yep. So um, a few interesting targets coming up, huh? Can you maybe give us the, the basic pitch on the waste and recycling side? Okay, so the circular economy package uh, will will review all the existing legislation on on waste at the at the European level. So it will affect definitely all all EU countries, and it will. It's currently like the proposal from the Commission is is pushing for a sixty five percent recycling rate by by 2030 and it, when it comes to bio waste it's pushing for mandatory separate collection of bio waste okay so all municipalities in europe will have to recycle 65 percent of their waste for those of you who are new to the topic um, a recycling rate does not include incineration of waste or landfilling of waste by the way, landfilling of waste will need to be limited to 10% in uh, in EU countries. These are the core obligations when it comes to targets. Then, of course, the the revision of the legislation calls also to promote um, prevention policies, to promote um, preparation for reuse, etc. So the the circular economy package comes within a wider, a broader set of measures that they will be presented um, until 2019 and the idea is to transform the whole European economy into a circular economy. And we have a little bit of a problem here in, in Sweden and Denmark as, as you know. Um, we, we burn a lot of waste, 50-55% uh, of the total municipal stream. So I'm wondering how how do you think this is going to play out? So yeah, as I said, um, there's a 65% recycling target and a maximum 10% landfilling, which um, for some countries will put some pressure. Some countries still landfill quite a lot, and so they will be obliged to reduce landfilling. But for some other countries, like Scandinavian countries, will push another type of pressure, which will make them close down incinerators, like. For instance, countries like Denmark that are 
burning 55% of their municipal waste and still importing waste from from other countries right. uh, will have to shut down incinerators. Otherwise, that they would, there's no way they can meet uh, EU targets. Yeah, because if we do the math, they will be able to burn only 20, 25% max of the of the waste stream, which is still pretty bad in a in a green city, um, so to say. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, burns, burns. But you know, I think we should give a call to a couple of incineration facilities right now <laughs> to find out, you know, how they're going to react to this or, or ask if they if they feel threatened by by the EU legislation. Okay. Um, they they may not fully grasp it yet, but it could be good to to get their reaction. Okay. And the reason why this is interesting for our story here is that a lot of the waste being burnt is bio-waste. And you remember in our first chapter, that's a lot of the carbon we're looking for to green up our agriculture and repair our soils. Okay, Ferran, uh, stay on the line. Let's see if they pick up. Yep. Just as a side note, we kept the call anonymous uh, because we haven't asked for permission to publish this and uh, they didn't know it was media calling. So uh, we even tweaked their voice a little bit to hide their uh, identity. But um, this was in Scandinavia, let's say. <laughs> Hi there, um, this is Camille Duran in Malmö. I'm currently studying waste management and uh, circular economy. Yes. Doing a bit, uh, doing a bit of research. Yes. And um, I'm looking here at the the new European targets. Yes. And uh, it says we're going to need to be recycling 65% of municipal waste streams by um, by 2030. Okay. Um, today we incinerate 50 or, or 55%, right? Um, according to Eurostats 2014. Yes. So I'm wondering, I mean, mathematically by 2030, uh, we need to reduce incineration down to... 20 or, or 25 percent um how are we going to to do that that's what i'm researching right now that's a good question um uh, we are not so concerned uh, uh, on the regional basis for our company today because first of all it's it's a long-term perspective hmm. uh, there's so much going to landfill in the eu still So we see we see uh, we have fuel because it's quite close to take waste from the, by boat from England or whatever today, and you have like la you have landfill levels of uh, Poland still 80% percent to landfill Romania 98% percent to landfill Bulgaria 98% percent to landfill so uh, we see that there's plenty of waste to be incinerated in the future for us as a company. But of course, for Sweden as a, as a nation, it's interesting to see if, how we can hide the amount of uh, uh, recyclable material. Okay, and, and if you had to close down a, a furnace or two in in the future, <laughs> what, what will happen? What, what is going to happen? And of course, we will make a little bit less money then, but uh, uh, we can maybe find other businesses concerning recyclable materials and so on. Mm. So, so for, as a company, we don't see it as a big threat. <laughs> okay, well, um, thanks for your help. No problem. Bye. Good luck. Bye. Bye. This hurts me so bad, Ferran. <laughs> so bad. Let's call another one, maybe, and, and you tell me what you think while it's ringing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The the, the probably what, what we what we see is that um, instead of of decreasing the amount of waste they are burning, they will just decrease the amount of uh, national waste they are burning. So they will probably import waste from other EU countries. Terrible. So as not to shut down uh, incinerators, which, in my opinion, is not only against the principle of of, of uh, proximity of treating waste, but also is is against the whole logic 
of well, rational policies. You're doing a, a you've done a bad investment. You overinvested in a facility, and instead of saying, "Okay, we f it up, mm. we messed it up." Uh, let's close down the incinerator. Let's uh, shift to like better ways of treating our waste. Instead of doing this, what they will be saying is like, okay, don't worry, Bulgaria, just just have to close down your landfill and send it over like 5,000 kilometers away or how, uh, 2,000 or whatever. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the risk. Yeah, but ultimately all EU countries will have to comply so then we'll probably be burned away from Russia. Very green. Hi there, uh, this is Camille Duran in Malmö. I'm doing a bit of research and um, I have a couple of questions. Um, could, could you please connect me to someone from the, the technical team? Uh, just a second. Thank you. One moment. Yeah, let's try to ask them for bio waste specifically. Okay. Hi there, uh, this is Camille Duran in Malmö. I'm currently studying waste management and circular economy, doing a bit of research. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking here at the new European targets, which say that separate collection of bio waste is uh, going to become mandatory. I'm wondering what is going to happen at incineration facilities if we start to well, collect this bio waste separately and compost it instead of burning it. Yeah, but 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 but, but we we are not uh, uh, collecting it separately. Yeah, but you're going to have to um, very soon, no? No, no, no. But how are you going to meet the sixty-five percent recycling targets without considering bio waste? Yeah, we are collecting uh, different things. Uh, Paper uh, and uh, and garbage from the household uh, uh, separately. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we we are, we are trying to recycle plastic, uh, glass, and paper, and and so on. But and um, and bio waste. You yeah. We 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 burn it. Uh, so okay. Well. Yeah. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Bye. 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 -bye. So Ferran, I suggest we dig a little bit into this last point here. If you're still alive after what you just heard, <laughs> what does the directive say about bio waste processing? Well, um, just just one second. I, I, I'm gonna look at the directive. Um, I mean, first of all, the revision of the legislation. What it says that um, bio waste has to be separately collected. Uh, therefore, I mean, it doesn't make sense that if you're separating it, then you mix it up again with the rest of the waste in the same facility and you burn it. Yeah, this is completely log illogical from any point of view, economical or environmental or whatever. Secondly, what it says is that, like, member states are not only obliged to separately collect bio waste, but uh, these bio waste they have to take the measures uh, to encourage the recycling it is the composting and the digestion of bio waste okay um, that's all we need really um, and when will that law be put in place EU law needs like gives around two years to translate this into national law so by mid 2019 something like that probably will have it uh, translated into national law which will start creating obligations but the most important thing is not when the obligations start but that there's a clear direction and the commission is giving a clear direction that this is the only way forward so municipalities know it already uh, regions know it already and countries know it already so there's no point on, on just uh, trying to push back I mean this is the only way forward and 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 sooner or later they will have to to start shifting and start transitioning
Karan, thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure it's not the last time we talk about this. T thank you, Camille. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. After all these pyrotechnics, we should listen to a bit of Rammstein to freshen up. In chapter one, we talked about all of the compost that we need to produce to repair our soils. And one feedstock we need to start transforming more seriously is bio-waste, whether it's garden waste or kitchen organic waste. Some people might think we're nuts. Whatever. Me? I collect food scraps from restaurants, manure from zoos. Manure. Do you know why? To keep this stuff out of landfills and use it to make good, rich dirt. That's why. Yeah, look, it's pretty simple. You work hard, you believe that anything is possible, and you try to make the world better. You try. As for helping the city grow good, green, healthy vegetables, that's the upside of giving a damn. N'est-ce pas? And I hear the Swedish side of the audience that tells me, yes, but you know, we're collecting and digesting some bio-waste already for, for biogas production. Yes, it's true. But those efforts are driven by energy markets, not by nutrients, not by carbon sequestration. For those of you who are not familiar with the basics of anaerobic digestion, here's how it works. Uh, you take your bio waste, you put it in a sealed digester, airtight, which is why it's called anaerobic digestion. In absence of oxygen, microorganisms are going to break down biodegradable material. It releases carbon dioxide and methane, which we capture and burn to create biogas. Basically, it's what happens in the stomach of a cow, except that the methane doesn't get burnt in that case. Now, what is left over in our digester, in the end, is called digestate. It's a stable, nutrient-rich substance. We've taken up what we call the quick carbon in the anaerobic digestion process, and now we're left with the slow carbon, all the lignocellulose, they call it, and the nitrogen, of course. <laughs> The nitrogen stays in the digestate. You remember Dan Noble, our expert from California? So now it can become a, itself a fertilizer, but it's also an organic fertilizer, meaning that it has a lot of organic carbon in it. Now, it's not composted, but it can be used as a compost feedstock. I know other folks that are turning it into biochar and others that are pelletizing it and turning it into a pelletized fertilizer pellet, which actually has a lot of carbon in it. Okay, so... This is really what interests us in order to create healthy soils. And um, in most cases, we're not leveraging this digestate properly because it either ends up in an incinerator or it's too contaminated to be used on the farmland. And we'll talk about this. Sometimes just the liquid fraction is used and, and sprayed over the fields. But still, a lot of work needs to be done here because this digestate could be really great stuff. Organic fertilizers tend to have a lot of carbon, and they can also have the nitrogen in different forms. The nitrogen may not be in an inorganic form like urea or, or nitrates. It could be in the protein form itself, which is the way, of course, the microbes are, and the plants are made with protein. So the pr nitrogen as a protein in the amino acid form um, those the amino acid fertilizers haven't been studied very much. Into my, I've asked a lot of agronomists, and most of them don't, don't know. The data is just not there. I feel we need to decide. If we start to seriously sell compost or other organic amendments in Scandinavia, do we sell it for its fertilizer value or for the cheapest disposal option for their ratepayers? 
The other one, which is much more new and complicated, is what is the market for the for closing the loop? Because if you're closing the loop, you're now entering into a whole new market world, which didn't exist in the past. So we have no reference points for the closed loop market. Yeah, and, and then people tell you, oh, but it, it's not economically feasible to to compost or and to to distribute. This, this product exactly, and they'll and and you'll t you know a person who's been into the take waste waste model, the linear economy, will tell you straight to your face, and they will be honest, and they will totally believe this that it's not economic to go organic or to close the loop. But yeah, it's not economic in the old take make waste system because that's heavily subsidized, and we're paying for all that waste disposal. And we're paying for all the environmental damages, but we're paying for those, you know, socially and environmentally. We're not paying for those individually. So that's that old thing about externalizing costs and, you know, and internalizing value, as opposed to externalizing, internalizing the costs and internalizing the value, but also taking account of the social and environmental value of the entire closed loop process. Our economics does not handle that right now. So we've got to, we're in the midst of a changing economic system, which means we're in the midst of a changing uh, value system for our enterprises, be they public or private. I love this. This is so fundamental, Then Thanks for, for making this point. <laughs> And I think we're ready to start debating now with our regional experts. And uh, we're going to talk about how we're going to advance all this. Dan, thank you so much for all your help across this, this quest for carbon. Uh, we'll keep you posted on what we find out, and um, yeah, you, you stay well. well. Thank you, Camille, and, and same for you, and it's always a pleasure. Okay, I think that With this first and second chapter, um, we're done setting the stage. You remember in the intro of the first episode, I told you we had two problems that could solve each other. Well, here they are. On one hand, we need to feed our farmlands with carbon. On the other hand, the EU is telling us to stop burning bio waste, which is a major feedstock for a renewable carbon industry. So there you go. I think we're ready to start debating how are we going to fix this with our guest experts from the region this time. That will be in the next episodes, coming soon on the Green Exchange. Keep up the good work in the meantime. <laughs>